Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Monica Profit, and I'm here with William Morales. William, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Monica. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so we met um, at a couple of real estate and blockchain meetups and conferences. We have a few different people that we've just overlapped with over the last few months. And I just, I saw what you were up to and I knew I wanted to interview you. You're doing some really creative stuff in the real estate space. I know you're interested in blockchain. You're not sure if you have a blockchain play yet, but right. you're just kind of looking at how these things fit together. Is that, is that kind of the overview of what you're up to? No, exactly. Um, what I'm trying to do, especially here in the New York City area, is to bring creative financing uh, into play. In other words, trying to get the owner who I'm talking to, a bunch of for sale by owners, and see if they were willing to let me lease the property from them. And then in turn, I sublease it to a future tenant buyer. So that's the play and the goal of doing it here in New York City, especially in the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn area and all those boroughs yeah so yes, that's exactly that's a complicated thing to put together i mean i remember when i was getting my real estate license this is funny we're just jumping into real estate even though it's a blockchain <laughs> podcast but you guys <laughs> we'll circle back we promise <laughs> but i was getting my real estate license uh, a couple of years ago and i remember I read something about the, the average number of laws you kind of have to memorize just know like right off the top of your head in almost every jurisdiction in the US is about, you know, 40, 30 to 40 laws, like fair lending, fair housing, yes. don't be a jerk, basic stuff that's like written in the law. Um, and, uh, and I remember seeing like the average number of laws you have to memorize for New York State and New York City it's like 1160. <laughs> there are so many laws. I mean, you're like, well, I want to do this thing. I just don't know if it's legal here. <laughs> it's legal everywhere else because it's like not that complicated. But man, New York, it's confusing. It's so confusing up here. No, exactly. And, and you know, and when we talked about it, you know, you, you, you would kind of have to say, no, yeah, we could work together on certain things because that was the goal here was, can I do this, the creative financing here in New York City? Can I uh, buy on a, on a lease purchase or a subject to, and then at the same time, find myself a tenant buyer who might not qualify for a mortgage because of, you know, their credit got dinged, maybe 2008 hit them and it still carried over 10, 12 years later. Yeah. But the goal is to promote home ownership. Right, right. And at the same time, obviously make a living, but also help somebody, help the owner out of a situation where he might be able not be able to sell the property and then find a tenant buyer who's willing to pay us monthly and then maybe within two, three years or sooner, cash us out and, you know, everybody's in a win-win situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can, I know that the people that own real estate that want to get out of it, it is like the last thing they want to do is hang on to it, have to deal with it, repossess it, put the roof on. Like, it's just, it's like, please just somebody come take this from me. It can be so tough. I've been in that position myself on, on every side. I mean, not as a tenant buyer myself yet, but you know, I've, I've done, um, I've carried notes for people and and let them purchase over time with me i've purchased places and then been like dying to get out of it like when is my unicorn gonna show up please <laughs> i just want to find my unicorn and like get out of this deal um and yeah i mean that's it's a it's a tough thing and so finding those people like you that want to put deals together and help the person that wants to get out of that property out person that wants to get into it in you know sometimes it takes something pretty creative and it's funny that you talk about financing because you know a lot of what everybody Everybody thinks to get into a house, they need to accrue debt. They've, that's the only way to do it, you know? And so right. I think with blockchain, we're looking at a lot of new models that let people um, help people to get into places by, by not accruing debt, but by, you know, paying off on over time, maybe getting a long lease and then paying yes. um, towards the equity over a period of time. And platforms like, you know, my platform actually are kind of like what, what really facilitates that. So not to just like promote myself on this, but it was interesting to find <laughs> you and go, wait a minute, as we're going to talk about your company, One World Properties, 
that sounds like something we get, we gotta, we're gonna have to circle back after this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. No, definitely. And, and I think, you know, it depends on who you talk to. And when I mentioned what I want to do, some realtors, unfortunately, that don't work with investors say, no, this is illegal. It can't be done. Some lawyers don't understand the platform or the process. So it's all about explaining it. it basically it's like leasing with an option to buy. Like when you lease a car, you lease it for a few years and then you have the option to buy it or get another car. Right. And pretty much it's the same thing in a house, so to speak. But the goal, again, the goal is, is just to promote home ownership and eventually buy my house that way. Right. You know, right. I, I'm, right now I'm renting, but eventually I want to buy a house. And if I could do it that way, especially if banks are being restrictive in certain criteria for lending. Now, you know, that you have to give a bank like a hundred pieces of paper before they finally decide, yeah. okay, you might be worthy. Right. Right. Yeah, it's so, kind of tough. I mean, I think especially even with younger buyers, you know, people that are in the millennial age bracket, they're going, you know, how am I going to ever get out from underneath all this student loan debt? Having student loan debt makes it so I don't have the right debt to income ratio to even qualify for a mortgage. You know, what I realized when I was, uh, gosh, I was probably 16 years old. I put myself through high school. So I was working full time in high school, staying in school, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. I listened to the, to the uh, after school special, stay in school kids. I was like, all right, right, exhausting, but I will. And I was working with people that had, you know, uh, college degrees. And I remember one day I got so mad because one of my, I found out my coworker made 25 cents more an hour than I did. This is like in 1992. So like, give me a break. Right? <laughs> so I was like, they make more money than me. Wait a minute. That's not fair. I'm trying to get by too. And then I found out about their student loans. All my wow. friends were 20 something just out of college working at a coffee shop. I'm 16. I don't even have a diploma. And it doesn't matter if I make 25 cents less an hour because I'm younger. In the right. end, after they paid their student loan payment off at the end of the month, I had more discretionary income. It's not like there was much money there, but I was doing better. I was like, wait a minute, how'd that happen? And when I saw that, I was like, student loan debt is the problem. I thought I am going to go to the most rinky dink, pay nothing in state, cheap as cheap can be. And it's <laughs> like, because I thought, okay, well, if I want to buy a house, you can get a mortgage as long as you don't have a lot of debt already, right? But, yeah. And then after that, you can still qualify for student loans. But once you have student loans, you don't qualify for a mortgage. Isn't that crazy? So yeah. like, I was like, okay, that's, I'm not going to do this whole mortgage. I'm going to do the mortgage first, student loan second, no matter what. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's a good strategy. Yeah. Everybody else should, uh, needs to do something like that eventually. Well, it's tough because, you know, like along the way, I mean, I'm, I have friends that have gone to really fancy schools and I'm so, I'm envious of them. I'm like, oh, you got a real education. You got such a good education. But, you know. I got a mortgage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have an asset now, still under your name. Still paying that off, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, how did you get into real estate? Uh, what did was it like? A, you just took some classes, or did you always were into it? Or was it your parents into it? No, um, I remember. Uh, I, I'll try to keep the story short. I don't want to bore your audience. I remember when I was working at at a different hospital, and I remember a sales rep came to me and says, "Oh, you should get into real estate." And I'm like, "Yeah, right." Anyway, I bought a book, which is called, I think, The Beginner's Guide to Real Estate Investing. Okay. And that's the first real estate book I ever bought. And I just started reading it, and I started going to seminars, like, in 2007 and eight. I was such a seminar junkie. I would go to every one of them. But then I started noticing that each of these seminars had an upsell. You have a three-day yep. weekend boot camp. And then from there, then they have the upsell to 30, 35, 40,000. They are not classes. in the real estate market. They're in the education paid, pay me to, to find out my thoughts market. Right. Yeah. So then uh, it took a few years because the problem is with, with those type of education programs, they give you everything. They give you wholesaling, uh, fix and flip, uh, tax needs, tax deeds, whatever. So all of a sudden you're overwhelmed. You don't know where to start. And I was that way. Yeah. I, I was all over the place. It wasn't until late 2016 that almost 10 years later that I said, you know what? I'm going to concentrate on owner financing. This is what I want to do. And then in 2017, I think it was June or July of 2017, I bought my first property in Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh. I saw it on realtor.com. I called the, the realtor, made an offer. The property was for sale for like 25,000. Wow. And that tells you something compared to New York to Pittsburgh, but it was yeah. in a decent area. I did my research. Um, I, I made an offer. Cash, 8000 They turned it down. Two weeks later, they called me back and said, hey, is your offer still available? Wow. I said, sure. I wired the money. Uh, the realtor was nice enough to work with me. He found me a tenant buyer, or should I say a buyer, 
And now we've been in contact for now almost two years. Wow. And he's been paying me monthly. I got a loan servicing company to collect the payments. Um, so pretty much I learned a little by little about, you know, outsourcing yep. some of the, the, the work. Exactly. I never went to see it, but I said to myself, I don't want to do this anymore. I took a chance and, and it worked. But now what I want to do is bring that type of creative financing here to the outer boroughs, like yep. what we talked about earlier. Yep. That's great. So pretty much that was it. Yeah. Um, and but I didn't do much in 2018. I was trying to, you know, uh, come up with different scenarios, how I could invest in real estate. I was looking in other states, but it wasn't until early this year where I d decided that uh, um, I wanted to work here in the New York area. And when we met, we started talking about real estate, blockchain, and how it, I, this could be incorporated. Yeah. And that's why I'm here today. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I mean, we we met, and then you invited me onto your podcast, actually. Yes. Right. Yes. So you and that'll be out podcast. very soon, guys. Yes. Be, yes. So yeah, peer to peer real estate. It. It's called. Is it peer to peer real estate dot com? Yes, peer to peer real estate dot com. That's peer the number two peer real estate dot com. Okay. Okay. And you yeah. have you've been at this a while now, right? How how many podcast episodes have you got now? I'm up to coming up this Wednesday, eighty four. Uh, and over, wow. over the last, but you know what though, I say like the first year when I started in early 2019, it was more of a hobby. I would do one interview every couple of weeks, every couple of months. And it wasn't until late 2018 to now that I started doing the show. And every Wednesday I posted up on iTunes, oh, the website great. and everything. Yeah. So, that's and, cool. and I just want to tell you guys some. I, when I met Monica, uh, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna call her out. I, I I figured that she was the headline speaker for this blockchain <laughs> opportunity zone that we were in. I was a moderator for the pe second panel on opportunity zone. That's right. And Monica, to me, was the head speaker because uh, she knew so much that I was enthralled. I'm like. God. And the person I was with, my friend, she goes, my God, I, we got to talk to her. I'm like, yes, don't worry. I'm already ahead of you. We got our business card. That is great. So, that is yeah, so that's great. what it was. You, you were our feature speaker at that event. That's how I looked at it. <laughs> I didn't it. know that at the time. I was just on the panel. But yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. the, one, the, the people with the podcast, they tend to have a lot to say. <laughs> exactly. That's true. That's very true. Because I, I never moderated before, but I remember like when I first got on and I was a little nervous and then I said, okay, wait a minute, let me think that this as a podcast. And then I, I was calm the last half hour. Right. Yeah. I, if you think about like a podcast, you're like, I'm just kind of talking to people. It's okay. I might as well be in my living room, just like with the mic in front of me. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny. So we, you know, because this is the new trust economy, we talk a lot about, um, different, very different uh, verticals. This just happens to be right up my alley because I love real estate and I'm in real estate and you're in real estate. So of course, of the two co-hosts that I have on my podcast, me and Tracy, I'm right. the one that is going to interview you. But, uh, okay. <laughs> but we talk a lot about the kind of blockchain plays that people may or may not have or that they want to explore in, uh, in their own business. So whether it's in media or they're saying, you know, do I want a utility coin? Do I want to try to tokenize something? Do I want to give people... Um, some kind of value system that um, are about like a system of, of incentivizing them to come and return or come back or to spread it or share it. Um, if it's in media, if it's in manufacturing, if people are like, how do I, you know, potentially use blockchain to do tracking supply chain or, or the manufacturing process. And then in real estate, it's like, you know, I notice people are going, wait, how can I use a token model or how can I use blockchain to make some of these, these pieces? Like you talked about um, finding a loan servicer to collect right. the money. Well, that's just one digital, you know, platform away from being obsolete, right? There are so many of these tiny little intermediaries that it took you 10 years to really kind of mull through it all and figure right. out how you were going to fit in that complicated ecosystem. And I think with blockchain, that's what we're seeing is there are so many complicated ecosystems, whether it's incentivizing people to return and engage your content, people to, you know, post and share your content, people to like your content or even engage it, people to, um, track supply chain or where things are coming from, where they went to, if they're authentic, if they're authenticatable, you know, right. that's even a word. And then there's, we've got people that are trying to just figure out how do I put all these financial pieces together to just make that person happy to get out of this deal and that person happy to get into it. It can be so, all of these are very um, complicated systems with a lot of intermediaries. And so I love hearing about how people have already taken an analog approach and gotten into their, their industry. They're doing something cool. They're making new, new solutions for people. They're, they're bringing value. And then 
they also now see, oh, I can make it even simpler if I just bring blockchain into this. So it's, it's interesting to see what you guys have already, what you've already done, but also how much easier it can become still. Well, that's the thing, uh, you know, when, when you get into real estate and, and you know, and you know this, you have to get uh, a, 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 um, a lawyer and then a bookkeeper, a CPA, a loan service. So it's all of a sudden you got a self like eight, nine members on your team that you didn't know you had or that you needed. Yeah. And now, as I'm learning through you, through blockchain and, and, and learning that, wow, everything could be kept under one umbrella. It just, to me, it's, it's a no brainer. It just makes it simpler. It's so and, simple. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And I, that's what I'm saying. And I'm learning as like, like I said, to the, to, to your audience, when I was at the, at that event with you, I'm like, Oh my God, everything seems simple. Okay. I just need to learn more about it. And, yeah, and, yeah. and that's, and that's the, always the education. You got to learn more about it. And, uh, and that's why I'm here on your podcast and I appreciate it. Uh, oh, absolutely. And I'm learning like I'm... more and more, more <laughs> about more and more blockchain. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, I know there are people out there that want to know, you know, what are people doing that could be including blockchain for, you know, in their own businesses. And then how does this relate to my business? And I see a lot of new innovators. We really reach out to people that are investing in new technology and we reach out to people that are innovating and, and they're, they're making new things and they, they want to see if blockchain is going to help them accelerate that. And so it's, it, I think it's just a rising tide really lifts all ships and finding people that are already doing such, you know, you're putting out a lot of legwork in your particular field of real estate. And so I just think there's a lot of room for us to help each other. And that's what we're just trying to shine a light on that because I think everybody has an opportunity to, to see how blockchain is going to really affect their, their lives and their businesses in the future. Well, and, and, and you, you hit on a point, I think with, 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 unfortunately the way the banking system is and, um, you know, and I'm not uh, downgrading banks or degrading them. Um, but I just think, if somebody's trying to qualify for a mortgage, you know, the paperwork that they have to go through, you know, yes, your credit might be dang because of what happened in 2008, nine and 10, but it doesn't mean that you can't qualify because you might have the money or, you know, people lose their jobs, unfortunately. And right. I think by, by trying to provide a service um, for a tenant buyer, I think that's the key is just trying to help the owner. Unfortunately, maybe they can't sell because maybe, um, the price might be too high or, you know, they're looking for something different, but then if I can help them out and I can help out a tenant buy and I can stay in the middle, then everybody, there's a, you know, a win, win, win situation. Yep. And that's, and again, that's what I want to provide. And that's what I want to do uh, for future homeowners. I think home ownership, it's a great thing. And it's, a, and, and I, contrary to what some, some people believe, I think it's still an asset. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I really think it's a it's a huge asset. Yeah, it's I mean it's one of the most stable things you can get, and it can be really hard to get into the into the game. I just think there's so many good opportunities out there, but if you don't already have the credit worthiness or the money, or you don't come from enough money, you just can't get into it. You know. So I'm very yeah. excited. Have you? I know that we met at um at an opportunity zone and blockchain event. Did you right. see any overlap for yourself at the Opportunity Zone specifically? Now, just for a little background for our um, for our listeners, Opportunity Zones are are places in the U.S. and Puerto Rico, which is the U.S., but all throughout right. um, the the lower four. I'm not sure if there's Opportunity Zones in Alaska, actually, but there might be. Anyway, they are places that <laughs> um, have been deemed uh, they need more investment. So they're a place where the average um, resident income is lower than the than a certain like a uh, threshold that's in the surrounding areas. So um, it basically says that the people that live here are struggling and not making as much money. So if you invest in that real estate, you can get all kinds of tax benefits as an investor. And right. it's a really interesting model. It's just come out um, and it's basically kind of hit the, it was approved, I think, in the last, within the last 12 months. So there's been a lot right. of interest by people that otherwise have short-term capital gains that they want to defray. They don't want to have to pay those capital gains. If they take that money that they'd otherwise be paying taxes on and they put it into an opportunity zone, they invest in real estate in these special places, then they can defer their tax uh, burden. And eventually, if they leave it in there for long enough, they can, they can uh, defer it to a greater amount. So there's some people with bigger money being really incentivized to put it into these places the places right. that exactly where people with little money are. So it's an interesting beginning of an ecosystem. Have you looked at Opportunity Zone specifically? Or have you seen any overlap for what you're doing and Opportunity Zone deployment of funds? No, definitely. Once I, once I finished that, that event that we were both in and I started thinking about it, I'm like, oh my God, you know, there's certain areas in New York City, like you said, yep. 
that qualify for an opportunity zone fund and, and investment. So yeah, I definitely saw an overlap. And over the last couple of weeks, I've been doing some research and I'm trying to target certain areas. Uh, eventually what I want to do is again, maybe uh, be a part of an investment group mm -hmm. that we could, you know, maybe buy uh, maybe a small building and turn it into, you know, uh, a, a, gr a great rental, an affordable rental, but also provide some amenities that otherwise they might not get. So I've talked to one or two of my friends and they're kind of interested. This is all at the beginning stage, but this is something that I, I definitely saw an overlap. Well, it's funny if you were, so this is actually one of my plans for my company is uh, with Rise with Rise Housing is that we're, we intend to buy a building somewhere in one of the opportunity zones here in Manhattan, probably the East Village or Lower East Side, which are opportunity sure. zones, oddly enough, if you can imagine an opportunity zone in Manhattan, it's crazy. But right. to, so to get that money deployed there, and then tokenize it. So basically fractionalize it, make it formal so that people that are tenants in there, they also can start purchasing shares in it and become part of the ownership of it until it's all been transferred from like the original owners being a small group of investors like you and your friends to the people who've been paying rent and buying the equity. And that gives you guys, the original uh, investors, a chance to diversify and slowly move away and divest from that, from that, one, uh, that one property and then be able to go and leverage towards the next ones and it lets the tenants start to own more of their buildings. So it's just, it makes a, a slow motion ecosystem where the people that need to buy can buy without having to get any lending and stay tenants, get, remain their tenants' rights. They still have all of the protections. And then in the end, think of it this way. If somebody has debt and they fall on hard times, they're, you know, they lose everything they put in. They are out on the cold. You know, they're evicted. They have, they're foreclosed on. And right. they've, now their, their credit is ruined. Now, if you're renting and you're purchasing some of your equity and you fall on hard times, you might get evicted or you might, but there's no law in the world that says that you're going to have to give up the shares that you bought in this comp in this, in this building. Those are yours. In fact, right. you could maybe sell your shares back and be able to make rent. So you're not all in and losing everything. When the bank takes no risk there, it's always the individual taking a hundred percent of the risk. So if you miss those payments, you lose everything. Whereas the bank just takes everything back. So it's a lot more fair and it lets you guys as individual investors get in, purchase your building and get out on your own terms. And the same with those tenants. I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, because you're, you're, you're providing, again, now you're providing the tenant with a chance to become owners. Exactly. Or at least like you said, they have some, uh, definitely some, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, some skin in the game. Exactly. You know? yeah. 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 And I, think, I, I love that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, I love that you're doing some um, interesting financing models and you're trying to, to financing. That was my little Texas coming out there. <laughs> financing models. <laughs> but I love that you're, you're kind of doing the same thing from different sides. You're going, how do I mess up the debt? Like, how, how do I you know, disrupt this debt idea? And I'm going, how yeah. do I disrupt the equity idea? So we're going to have to go get drinks soon. I swear. You're, you're fun. We have, to, we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> I know. Sounds good. That's, and, or, and for your audience, we'll definitely bring, I, on my show or, or on uh, Monica's show, we'll definitely talk more about this. Oh, absolutely. This is, I, I think, again, just giving it someone a chance to, to you know, to become a homeowner, um, I still think it's the American dream oh, absolutely. compared to what it was 2000. You know, I think home ownership down, I think it's down like three or four percent than it was, maybe more than it was in 2008, eight nine because of, you know, obviously people lost jobs, whatever, but you know, you got these banks that are so restrictive. Yeah, really restrictive. Um, You're right. Yeah. And it's tough. It's like, and they're not even taking all the risk. You know what I mean? It's like, come on, guys. Like, if we if we mess up, you're taking all our money anyway. I mean, they're basically no, exactly. buying properties at 80% of total price because they're making put 20 into yeah. to begin with, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, well, I'm just so glad you had the time to meet with me. This is really, it's been great talking with you, seeing that you have a potential Same blockchain enough. play. I love this, like seeing innovators, like kind of noodle on blockchain and go, wait a minute, that's going to work for me. So it's really exciting. No, I, no definitely. Because I think it, this is a new opportunity for us yeah. and for anybody else that wants to get into, you know, just learn about blockchain. There's tons and tons of articles yeah. written about it. Uh, there's YouTube videos. There's Monica's show. <laughs> Look at Rise. Uh, yes, and I'm promoting. Yes, I'm biased. <laughs> Risehousing.io. 
<laughs> Definitely go there. You're so <laughs> funny. Well, also, but, you know, I think if somebody, uh, listeners out there, they should really, if you're interested in this, uh, in, in the, any of the things we talked about, yes, blockchain, yes, real estate, yes, peer-to-peer finance, peer-to-peer real estate, but also um, just check out Opportunity Zones. I mean, and if you yeah. ever have any more questions, if any of you would like to learn more about Opportunity Zones, what blockchain is doing to streamline investment into them, you know, they're, we're working on it. I'm working with a few groups that are doing Opportunity Zone funds that mm-hmm. aggregate people's money to deploy it into these places where you get the tax benefits. So um, there are just so many opportunities. It's just a matter of drinking from a fire hose and, and being able to digest it all. So yeah. <laughs> I like that analogy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much, William. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, Everyone, thank you Monica. It's my knowledge. pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I just check him out at peer to peer real estate.com peer to peer with a two in it. Um, yeah. And yeah, I it. I, I, in fact, I shortened the URL, what? Uh, which I forgot. Yes, it's P. 2PRE.com. Now. Oh, that is, yeah. Okay, that's a little. Just easy. made it simpler. Yeah. So typos. It's P2, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> too, uh, too many people told me, is it two R's? And I'm like, oh, something's Uh-oh. wrong there. So it's just P, <laughs> the number 2PRE.com. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for being on the Thank show. Thank you, Monica, for having me on it. It's, it's been a, a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Excellent. Well, thank you and have a wonderful day. I'll catch you next time on the New Trust Economy. Sounds good. Thank you. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.